Okay, so let's take a look at how I came up with this uh, particular add-in. One thing you probably want to do, I recommend you do this because it's really cool. You could go to this page and download Visual Studio 2022 version, which has just been released, as you can see here. And it will download it like here and it will take you through the install. Now, it, be aware, it takes up a lot of space, but I don't know if it's almost five gigs or something of space. So if you prefer not to do it in Visual Studio 2022, which was kind of smooth way of doing it, then you can always try to do it in, in um, VS Code. So anyways, you can download the Visual Studio 20, 2022 from here, whatever version of it you want. Now the free version obviously is this community version. And it works quite well actually. Uh, I've been using it for a while now, for a, maybe a week, week and a half, something like that. Let's fire it up and take a look at the project. So I'm gonna open Visual Studio. I used the preview edition. I think the version that I downloaded today is the, the actual one, the release version. However, this, this is one I've been working with. It's opening up and it seems to be a lot more responsive than in the past, and it's faster, and there's a few really nice features in here they have worked on. So let's open up this project, and then I'll show you how to set up the project from scratch, basically. I'm not going to build it from scratch, but I'll show you how to get started with one of these type of projects. This is what it looks like, but let's say you want to create a new project here. So we'll go to open a new instance, and once you open up a new instance, you can go and say, I want to create a new project. And what you want to choose, and of course you want to see all this when you first start, but you can say Excel, maybe add-in, something like that. And here you see Excel web add-in. So you can choose that one and say next. And then of course you give it a name and you say create and use these frameworks, the .NET framework. So that's how you start it. And then once it spins up, it will create something like this, where it has two projects, one that deals with the office setup type of thing, and one that is the web projects. And of course, that's the one that you're going to be hosting on a web server somewhere, so you can uh, set a reference to it in your add-in. It comes with a few folders here. There is this content folder that holds these uh, CSS files, etc., that Microsoft is providing you with here. This fabric setup here. It has all kinds of um, CSS references here, as you can see, that you can use. The key uh, file, if you will, in this project is going to be this manifest here. So this manifest is going to hold information about your project. And basically, when you're done, if you want to have some safe domains that you're referencing to, you can put those in here, the URLs you can put in here. To start off, your source location is going to be this one right here. So that's going to be the one that you populate with your URL that points to your add-in. This also is a unique add-in that was generated by Visual Studio. If you do this by yourself, you have to go and create the GUID. Um, so, yeah. So that's a little bit about the manifest. So make sure that you, all the default values you need to have in your manifest are, are available here because that's what is being read. Anyways, this is done mostly by Visual Studio, so you don't have to worry about it here. Uh, if you do it in the VS Code, you might have to reset some of these values here. So let me close this. What we have here is some folders. I have some images I, I, I added to this for my logo and stuff that goes into my add-in. Uh, there is some functions here that I don't use that was just spun up for me. There's a scripts folder, and this is basically mostly scripts that are produced by Visual Studio, like jQuery type of files that are putting it in here. This message banner, JS, etc. So all this stuff is kind of coming with the project. Now I created this file myself, and I'll get back to that in, in, a, in a bit. The key other files is going to be this web handling file here that are basically doing the web request. There's a home CS file that I sometimes override some of these CSS attributes with my own class here. 
so I set it here so I get it just the way I want it. Plus, it's a little easier to to get a feel for what goes into this when you you know use your stuff. And then there is a HTML page, home HTML that has some HTML I have been adding in. And then you have the key driver file, which is the JavaScript file that basically builds this add-ins content. Then there are some other packages here, some configs, but basically listing some of the uh, references that goes in here that you're going to need in order to run this project. And then you have the web config. And one thing I did in here, because I'm going against sometimes large data, large amounts of data, I should say, in a JSON file. I added this scripting tag in here under this system web extension where I set the max JSON length, a really large number here. That way I don't get cut off. You know, when, when you retrieve the JSON file, it, I had some issues initially. It was sometimes when I choose like five years or whatever worth of data, it kind of cuts it off. So I had to add that in. So that's something you might want to do. Now, in this one here, I don't need this, but and in a separate video, I might go through how to work with an add-in against databases. So I have this database uh, reference here, the, the connection string to my SQL Server database, but I don't use it in this web add-in. So, okay, so that's a little about the project. The calling syntax work. Here is the home page. It sets a bunch of references on the top here. And if you wanted to, you could add your own little script tags directly in here as well. Uh, in my case, I don't do that. But some of this is generated by Visual Studio. Some some you can add in yourself. You can see here it references this Fabric class. And some of this was generated when I first opened this page. It was already there. So it then is a matter of going in and removing what you don't want to see. So I added my own little div here where I add my logo, which is this Yahoo Finance that you saw on the top of the page. Let's just fire it up so I can kind of cross-reference as I go here. So it might be easier to see it for you. Yeah, so this div here is the logo itself. If you want to see what it looks like, that's this black logo you see on top here. Then you see this financial data module. That is something you will be setting in your manifest. So if you go to your manifest and you look, you can see the display name is set right here. So that's what shows up in my Excel top here and this one here. That's the display value. So you set that in this manifest file. The next thing that happens here is that I have some additional divs. I have one for ticker header. And then I have basically just creating some simple select boxes that holds the parameters you can use for the ranges when you pass into this, this particular web API for Yahoo Finance. What I'm saying here is that this is the range that I was showing, and this is the select box with all the options in it. And that's what I was pointing out here in my HTML, this piece here. Just so you can get a sense for what this, uh, the output of the JSON file is. So I'm opening up this Insomnia program here. I'm going to just run a quick request. And this is what the query string looks like that goes to Yahoo Finance. And if you copy that out and just look at it in a text file here somewhere, let me just open up the notepad. So as you can see, this is basically the base URL, and then you're passing in ticker symbol, and then there's some additional information here, and then you get to the range. So this is where you set the range from the Excel workbook. So this is the range. You choose one of these guys here. So when I run it now, you can see it runs, and this is what it comes back with. It starts here, and then it has another object called result, then it, that's an array. And the metadata here you can see is the ranges. So that's the one I have in my drop list. Then there's a timestamp. And notice the timestamp here is of this format, which is a Unix timestamp, meaning it's something called epoch timestamp. That means these are the number of seconds that has expired since January 1st, 1970. That's basically what it means. So we have to convert this into a proper date, and that's what we're going to do. Then there's an indicator which is an object that has another uh, key called quote, which is an array of objects. So we have a low, which is an array. So that's the low price, the volume, the high price, open, close. And then there's another category here called adjusted close, which is adjusted for dividends, stock splits, etc. That's an array, and that has only one 
member, the adjusted close, and then that's the end of the document. So that's what we're working with. So now, as you can see, I'm passing in from the metadata. Here are the ranges, the options for that. This is when we do the filtering. These are all the available filters that you can use for dynamic filtering for, say, dates. Okay, so this happens to be dynamic filtering for dates. And you can see there's a lot of different ones here. And we're going to take a little closer look at that when we get to the filtering portion. Then I have a hidden field, a hidden div, that keeps track of the row count. Now, the reason for that is because we're switching between Excel and JavaScript constantly here. And you have to sync it between the two sources. And sometimes you have to do a batch operation where you execute some JavaScript code and then you flush it over to Excel. And sometimes there's a timing problem when you actually write this code, especially when it's dynamic, because you need to know how many rows are in here and how many rows, uh, if I already created a table in Excel, how many rows are in the Excel table, not in the uh, arrays that I used in JavaScript, etc. So sometimes it gets a little tricky. So I use this little trick here and have this hidden that holds the row count. Then there is a stock table I create that has two headers. And if you remember from this one, you can see it right here. This data and the charts in the dark area here. And then there's a bunch of buttons, as you can see, that does different things. So without getting too detailed here and take too much time, I'm just going to go through those pretty quick. So here is one button, and I just have it in the basic table here. First row, and here's the first cell has this button here, and that's the one who gets the Yahoo data. The second button here is just simply uh, going to create the chart. So this is the first one to get the data, and this is the chart. And, and then you have the rest of them just laid out like this. So that's basically what the HTML table is doing here, as you can see all these buttons, right? And I have a button ID, and that's important because I'm referring to that when I run my code. We have a footer, and then there's a banner section too. And that's the one who generates the thing down here when you get the data. So for example, if I did three months and I click get data down here on the on, it puts a message in here, retrieving data from Yahoo Finance. This may take a minute. And then it populates the data and then you can format it, rate of return, etc. So that's what that banner does. That's this piece. And that's some dynamic animation going on in here. So that's the home HTML page. So this one is the home JavaScript page, so the home JS file. And if you look at this one, uh, it, it simply populates this file with some stuff. So this is already built in when you, you script this out in Visual Studio. This is the key, Office Initialize. In order to run this, you have to initialize your add-in. And that happens inside this block here. Here is some jQuery stuff, document run ready function. You're going to run this stuff. And it sets up some elements here, like HTML stuff for the banner, as you can see. And it hides the banner here, as you can see. Now, this is where you set up kind of the construct of what you're going to be doing. If you have older than 2016, then you have to use some fallback logic. This one is basically referring to this ID, which is a div. And then it's going to have some text in here that you're going to be displaying. And that is only if you have fallback logic. And then I'm setting up all the stuff that I'm going to be doing in my add-in, as you can see. Please select the desired type interval, which is this piece here, right? That, that in there. And then you set some default values for the text ticker, which is the text box here. So I'm setting this default value there. And then I have a bunch of buttons in that HTML I just showed you that on the click event, I'm going to try catch and fi fire off this particular function. So all of these buttons fire off the click event and they're calling their individual functions right here. So that's how it fires us up and started. Then I have another function here that is run whenever I do my Yahoo Finance get. So let, we can look at that. So if I go here, and if you go into this function, you can see I'm calling this function to attach this script. And that script here, it basically dynamically adds to the DOM. So here you can see I create a variable that calls the document create element. And it's a script element, and they get attached to the header of that HTML document. And the type is going to be this, JavaScript. And I'm attaching this JS file, which was that get uh, data file. The get data file sits inside the scripts tag here, and it's called get data. 
And basically what it is, it's an async function because it creates a bunch of promises and they have to be fulfilled before you can continue with the rest because otherwise it runs sequential and it just gets right through it and nothing gets time to finish. So I have an async function here that is called get data from web service. It has two query selectors. One gets the ticker from that text box and one gets the range. So what I'm getting is I'm getting this value and I'm getting whatever was selected in this data drop list here. And then I take those and I put them into this data portion of the Ajax call. I'm loading the results in here and there's a function based up upon success. I want to return this data D object. That's the way it comes back from the JSON return object. And as you can see, I'm simply passing in the range dynamically and the ticker dynamically. Then I'm calling my web handler, the ASMX file, and this is the function I'm running. So what does that ASMX look like? Well, that's this one. And as you can see, there are some references here. By the way, in, in Visual Studio 2022, you can set, set some parameters in a um, project file that make this implicit. So these may or may not be needed and they can go into one place. I don't have to repeat them for every class you put up. You don't have to put this stuff up anymore. So anyways, just a side note. So this uh, decorates with some uh, settings here that comes with it when it spools out this file. And then you have a web method down here, which is this call that I just showed you from the getData.js, which is this function here. If you look at that one, it, here comes the ticker and here comes the range. So that's how you can do it in a post, like I showed you. And I'm creating a public list of output string that I'm going to return. So the JSON output comes in form of an array when it comes back. Here is the base URL I talked about from the uh, Insomnia. The base URL was this first portion of that one. And then you have the dynamic version of it, which is this one. So as you can see, I simply do some formatting here, string formatting, passing in the first parameter here, passing in the second parameter for the range here, which comes from these two guys, which you can see at the end here. Then I'm building my URL by combining the two. Then you create a web rec request and put the URL in. Sometimes you have to pass in some credentials here, the default credentials. So you might have to also sometimes pass in a header, the Mozilla, the user agent Mozilla. So I don't know if that you need that or not, but I didn't need it here. So here I'm creating the response that comes back from the request. Here you can just write it out so you can see it. Here I create a stream object where you stream the, the response from the web API into this. And then you can create a stream reader. And then you can read to end using the stream reader and load it into this string variable. And that string variable is the one that we load into the list object here. And you close the reader, the data stream, and the response. And this is some new syntax that Visual Studio formatted for me when I was writing my initial code. It suggests that you can, you can clean it up and make it simpler. And this is what it basically ended up doing. And I just accepted it, and that's what it gave me. Then I returned the list data back, and it comes back to this function here. And it goes into this response array, and that's what I'm returning back into my, my home JS. That's that script that is get attached to the DOM here. It doesn't get called from here, but that's what attached to the DOM. So most of the... The, the stuff that brings the data back sits in this import JSON data. So I have this show notification that basically calls that banner. There's a function at the end of here that, that basically you're passing in two parameters here. You can see it right here. And it basically builds the output in that banner for, from that. And if you look at the code here, you start always when you run these function, you do a wait, Excel run async and you have a context that you're passing in here. This is inside this async function. So you await it. So it's a promise and you wait till it's done and then you sync it. That's the second thing you always have to do. When you flush it to Excel, you always have to do this await sync, await context sync. That's when you actually see the changes. These are getting batched up and before they get put into Excel. The only other time I use the async twice is when I needed something back from Excel so I could continue using it. And I have a function somewhere here that basically does that. I'll try to remember which one it is. I think it's this one here. 
when I do the data bar stuff. You can see here, I create this table rows and load the items in it here. And then I have this sync call here. And then in within here, I do continue with the rest. In this case, I was trying to get the row count from the table object. And you can see it. First, you have to load it like this, all the items in the table. Then I can get the row count from it after it's been synced. So that's the key. Sometimes you also have to get properties from the underlying Excel object in order to change them. So that's another story, but you can find some examples of that in the script lab. So make sure what I don't get from this, you can check out with the script lab. And the reason I did it in this function is because I needed the row count to build this dynamic range because I never know in my table how many rows I'm going to be working with. So this was one way of getting it. The second way of getting it was like I showed you where you basically st you store the value in that hidden div, the, the row count that came back from the arrays. That's another method I used. So I didn't want to do this every time to load it from Excel because I didn't know what it would look like because it batches, syncs it back up, and then it suddenly changes, and then you go back again, and so it becomes messy. Here is where the main work happens. I'm going to run this async function. This one gets the worksheet st called stocks, if it exists, and deletes it. So it gets the stock and deletes that worksheet from it. Here I'm adding the sheet. So I'm basically rebuilding it right here. Then I have a table I want to add, which is going to be that table you see. I want to add it from A1 through G1, which basically is just going to be the headers. And I'm going to call it financial data. This piece here, you can see I used uh, some of the code from the script lab here, expenses table, which is, you know, this piece here. but. A little inconsistent. I should have used financial data. Anyways, here I'm setting the values in that first range, which is the first row, A1 through G1. These are the headers I want to use. And you have to kind of put them in like this array of arrays, if you will. Okay, so it becomes like two brackets before and after, even though it's only one array within here. Then I'm attaching that script to the DOM that's going to make the actual call, the, the get data JS through the web handler. Then I'm calling it here using the await function. This is going to bring back the text representation of the JSON object. I'm going to put it in here. Then I'm going to parse it out as JSON. And I do that here. But this JSON out D object has one array within it. And that's why I put this array symbol here like this. And that goes into this JSON response. From this JSON response, if you remember from Insomnia here, you have all these parts, right? These guys. And that's what I'm drilling into. So you go in charts, result, array zero. You're going into timestamp for the timestamp. You're getting an indicators quote zero. And that's basically what the drill in here does. So you have the outer object here, chart, result, array zero, timestamps, chart, result, array zero, indicators quote, array zero, open object, close and so forth. Actually, this is an array, but so I'm load those into its individual arrays. So I got a bunch of arrays. Then I create another array here. Then I do a for loop over the date time because the date time will always have the date, all the, the values in it that represents the dates. And all these others should have the same number of records in them. So by just grabbing one of them, the date time, I do a for loop. I create a new array. Then I load the date time, but because JavaScript shows the Unix timestamp in milliseconds, to make it into a JavaScript date, you have to use milliseconds. So that's why this was in seconds, because that came as a Unix timestamp. You have to multiply by a thousand to get in milliseconds. Then you can use this two local date string function in JavaScript to make it look like a regular short date. And that's what I'm doing here at pushing in the date timestamp into a date format here. Then I do the open, the high, low, close, adjust the close and volume based on the array index here. And then I put the whole thing into this array. And that's the one now is in form of rows that we can use. Then I set up my hidden row count here by getting the array out length. It'll tell me how many rows there are. And then I do some formatting to this used the sheets used range, which is the um, the table. 
you can order fit the size of the columns and the rows. Then I'm getting a cell, call it from H1, and that's the one I want to end up with. So it doesn't select the whole table, but it goes to cell H1 and then it finishes there. And then it syncs up and then it sh hides the ma message banner. So all the stuff we just looked at now is basically this, running this get data. So you can see here, it loads the data over here, it puts the banner in, it removes the banner and it comes back and it goes to cell H1 and finishes. And that's what you just saw. And then I have the format data. So the way that works is, and of course you can go to script lab and, and find information about how to do some of this. Uh, I might have a little extra in mind, but uh, you find similar information there. So if you look at the code that does right here, the formats the data. Typically what you do is you get a hold of the sheet you want to use, which is a stock sheet. You get a hold of the data table you want to use, which is this. Then you can do some formatting like this. And you remember you put them inside the array of arrays. So I want to have like this format. So basically two decimals. Then I loop through the number of columns I want to use. Remember, I don't want to format the date to this and not the volume either. So I only do one through five here. And that's the one I get the data body range from, and I set the number format equal to this format here. And then I also sort, you can see it here, get that same range, and apply a sort. The key is the date column, so that's the zero based column, and I want to do it descending order, and that's why I set it to false here. And then it goes ahead and it auto fits the columns, and then activates the sheet, and then of course you have to sync the changes back to the Excel workbook, and that's what happens here. The rate of return, similarly, you can see I'm getting a hold of this. I sort it, same sorting routine I just showed you. Then I create this constant called continuously compound rate of return, and I use the log function here, and so I set it up like this. Because I sort it descending here, I want to take the latest row divided on the previous row, and that's why I put it like this. Then I'm getting the rows of the finance table, which is the uh, table on the spreadsheet, and then load the items. You always have to use this load here before you can sync it when you want to get these rows. So you have to use the load function. Then you put inside a return, context sync. Here you get the count of the table rows. Here you set the array of the formula. And the reason I'm doing this is because I have to repeat this formula for every row. Otherwise it will crash and say, Number of rows doesn't match the shape or whatever, something like that. That's why I'm doing it this way. So I get the row count, and then I basically push it into this array, and I have this format I want to use, and I here I basically add a new column to the table, and I pass in the formulas for that particular column, which is the rate of return, and then I apply it, the formats, and then I do my auto fit and sync it back again. So that's what that one is doing, which is the rate of return, which is this one. So it adds a column, puts it in the formula, and then it formats it accordingly. To clear the formats, you click the button and it attains the sheet, gets a range of the sheet, and just clears everything. It just removes everything. So that clears the conditional formatting. To apply the conditional formatting, again, get a hold of the sheet, get a hold of the table, here you get a hold of the rows, load it, and then you do your sync function here, the row count of the table. Here you can set the range dynamically, which is what I'm doing here, F2 through F, whatever it is for the table, depending because, you know, we load different JSON sizes basically based on month, one month, six months, what have you, so it changes. And then you can use this technique, range conditional formats add, and the format type here in this case is data bars. And of course you can find them in Excel by going to conditional formatting and figure it out there. And then you can set the bar direction from left to right. And then you can basically format it here by you doing this. And then of course you do your sync again. You can say do the same thing with icons. In this case, again, loading, you know, before you sync up because I need to get the range, get the count from the, from the uh, table dynamically create a range here like this. And in this case, I'm adding conditional format icon set. And here you use this conditional format icon set. You use the type triangles. Now one thing with these triangles is that is explained here 
is that uh, there's three of them, but you only need to set two because the lowest one would automatically be set. So you just need to figure out that for the first one here, I'm using equal to zero. For the second one here, it's the positive one because the lowest one is going to be the negative one. So that'd be the, the third one. As you can see, you can just read this piece here to understand what happens. And then you go to your auto fit again and do the format auto fit and, and that's that one. So at this point, we are at the chart. So what we just did was add the bars. That's that. And then you have add icons. That's this. And remember, it looks for this, uh, this column's value. So if it's negative, it comes uh, downwards. If it was equal, then it would be just a little yellow, like a minus sign that would show up. And that happens when the two prices, like say here and here, was the same. And therefore, this would be zero change. Then you can just clear the formats here. And then you have this price chart. So when you click on that, it builds this chart here. And if you look at the code for that, you can see add a candlestick chart with open, close, high, low, that type of thing. And uh, that's, that's that type of chart you're looking at here. So if I do maybe uh, five days, might be easier. Let's just get the data and then format it and then price chart. So as you can see, this is what's called a candlestick chart. To do that, you can use this stock open, high, low, close type of chart. And you can set the row count I'm getting from that hidden div. Like the ticker I'm getting from this, you're getting the value from this text box I'm using jQueries. And then I basically set whatever was selected from this range object. So in this case would be five days, right? 5D. And then you're setting this dynamic row count. You add a new chart of this type. And here's the data range, which is this dynamic one here. And then you make it auto or you, you have some options here. You can do auto or I can't remember what it is. Uh, you can see it here at the end. Auto something here. Anyways, then there's a chart style and you can probably figure these styles out from uh, if you write a VBA macro or something and get a number out of the chart style. I, I read it to be 324. That what it means is that um, the chart style is this type here, you know, it's style three here, but you know, behind the scenes that you can refer to it as this. And I'm applying this eight, whatever that was, that's that I got from the VBA code, I think when I wrote it. Anyways, the different type of charts you can use. I'm setting the position here, the chart position from J2 to Q2, uh, Q20, which of course is not going to work when you do all the filtering because you're shifting these cells up and down. But it starts at J2, it goes through Q, uh, as you can see, Q20 here in the corner here. So that's what that one does. And now uh, the legend, you set that, I set it to right, set the white color. Then I create a dynamic title for it, where I pass in the range object here and the ticker. And that's why you see that the ticker was AbbVie for five days. Right, that's what I chose over here. So that's what I get from that jQuery. And that's that one. Finally, then we simply have the remove chart. We have the filter table type of things. And then, much like before, I'm getting the filter from here, the one I want to use. And if you recall, there was a lot of different filters here from this drop list. So whatever you chose here is what I'm picking up. And that's what I'm getting from this piece here. So that's the selected filter. Get a hold of the table, the, the sheet. Then I'm setting the filter here based on the date column. That's going to be the filter. And I'm applying the filter here. And there's a couple of ways you can apply these filters. This is taken from the uh, script lab. This is when you actually do a values filter. That's a little different. The one I use is this dynamic filter, as you can see here. And I'm setting it equal to whatever this filter I'm picking up is. So you can do it like this. Apply it. The filter on it dynamically and the dynamic criteria is Excel dynamic filter criteria equals to the one that comes from the drop list from here. And then I'm calling the banner to show you what filter you have chosen. So when you actually run the filter, we can remove the chart. We can filter the data. And as you can see, 
it puts the filter message down here above average or whatever it was used here. Doesn't always make sense, but okay. Those are the filters. And then you can clear the filters by running this code and clear the filters and then hide the banner out of doing it. Then you can remove the chart from the chart charts collection on this sheet, which there's only one of, get the first one and delete it. And that's all we do here. And that's the end of those functions. That's the add-in.